Welcome to another episode of Success Innovation. In today's episode, I talk to Julio Cesar Lugo, who works as a 529 plan for Scholars Share in the TIAA. Well, join me to learn more about the 529 plan and how it can benefit you and your children in the future. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, for another wonderful episode of Success Innovation. Uh, this is the first episode of the year 2020, and it's a brand new decade, so let's go and hit it forward really hard. Um, today, I have Julio Cesar Lugo, and Julio Cesar Lugo, thank you for joining me yeah, here, Julio course. Cesar. Thank and you, Lastro. His, you know, I'm going to read his bio, uh, because he does a lot of stuff, and he, the, in this particular one, he has eight years of experience in financial services. Julio actively holds Series 6 and 63 security security licenses with FINRA and works for TIAA, which is a tuition financing institution as a financial consultant focusing on 529 college savings plans. And that is exactly what we're going to be talking about and focusing our conversation on, the 529 plan. So once again, Julio Cesar Lugo. Yeah. And do, do, did I miss anything there? No, I pretty much covered it all. Uh, okay. Chula Vista native, so I know that uh, we're, we're in the city of Chula Vista right now, so I'm happy to be here, happy to be in my hometown. So. Thank you. What high yeah. school did you go to? Hilltop High School. Hilltop High. Oh, yeah. you know, I had a session today with a couple of Hilltop students. Oh, it is? Uh, yes, yeah. this, just this morning. So I was helping them out. Uh, we're playing an event for January 21st. Perfect. Um, so the reason I... And this is funny because I saw you giving a conference at a local middle school yes. and you were talking about the 529 plans yes. and the importance of the 529. Yes. 529 plans have been around for a few years, yes. more than a decade. Yes. And I started hearing about this 529 plan, but there's a lot of misconceptions mm -hmm. and a lot of people are still not very informed as to what they can do and what a 529 actually does for them. Yes. Can you kind of quickly in a nutshell explain yeah. what a 529 plan is? Of course. So a 529 plan is a tax advantage way for parents or families to be able to save money for future college expenses where the money grows tax deferred. Then you can withdraw that money later on for qualified higher education expenses and withdraw it tax free. So what the benefit being is that you're able to deposit money in this account today, grows tax deferred, the growth of it grows tax deferred. Later on when you need that money for college, you're able to withdraw it tax free and use it for qualified higher education expenses. So what's the difference of me just, you know, having the money in a savings or a checkings account yeah. where I can, it, it's essentially a liquid account mm -hmm. so I can draw, withdraw, but I can, you know, essentially be disciplined and start saving. Of course. Uh, the difference we would like to highlight is that the, the tax deferred growth on there. So in, in any other account, whether you deposit in a savings account, you're going to have to pay taxes on the interest accrued through that savings account each year. So on your 1099-I, you'd have to pay taxes on that interest, whether you deposit the same in the stock market or brokerage account. At the moment you draw that money, you have to pay capital gains taxes on that. Okay. So whenever you're uh, investing in mutual funds or the stock market, at the moment you withdraw that, if there's growth, if there's any gains in that account, you're going to have to pay taxes on those gains. When you're saving specifically for college expenses, higher education expenses, the 529 plan really is going to be your best option because of that tax deferred growth, because you're able to save money for future college expenses. At the moment you use that money, you're not going to have to pay any money on that tax deferred growth, um, specifically any taxes. So if you're looking for saving money specifically, we always like to highlight specifically for higher education expenses, this is going to be your, your best option as far as uh, tax deferred growth, be, have not, not to pay any taxes on that growth, and the money's deposited after tax, uh, very similar to like a Roth IRA. So you mentioned a Roth IRA. What is the benefit of me going into a 529 versus a Roth IRA, or I'm assuming I know a little better about a Roth IRA, mm -hmm. and I can have more diversity in there, I have more control, I can go see what the interest rate is that I can actually achieve, and it might be higher than the 529. I have no idea what a 529 percentage Rate increase is, return yeah. is, right? Yeah. yeah. ROI. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know how that compares to a Roth IRA. Yeah, of course. So with the Roth, what we like to highlight is uh, whenever you're saving money for retirement, keep that specifically for retirement. Of course, prioritize when you speak to your financial advisor. I'm sure you've spoken to one last little but they're going to prioritize uh, retirement first, then everything else after. Uh, when you're saving for retirement, try to keep it in the retirement bubble. I can't provide any, any advice on that, but 
usually if you take money from your Roth IRA or any type of retirement account, whether that be 401k or Roth IRA, individual retirement account, you're going to be taking away from your retirement money. So that nest egg that you have for retirement, you're going to be pulling money away from that when you have limited uh, funds to be able to deposit that. If you want to save specifically for higher education, there's a product that was created by the IRS, the 529 plan, that's specifically made for that, that gives you higher contribution limits than your retirement individual retirement accounts. With whether that's the individual retirement account uh, uh, that you're saving for, those have smaller um, incremental limits that are placed on, on an annual basis. When you're saving for higher education in a 529 plan, uh, the limits go up to say $15,000 for individual tax filers. If you're a married couple filing joint, those limits go up to $30,000 per year. You can take advantage of five-year lump sum contributions as well, where you're not just limited to that um, individual retirement account contribution limit. You can also meet that uh, retirement limit on your retirement, you say your Roth IRA, and then also meet the highest limit on your, your 529 plan as well. You mentioned a good thing, uh, last little, with the, the investment options, you know, the return on investment. With most 529 plans, uh, specifically, we, we administer the Scholarship 529 College Savings Program. And that's specific California. for California. For right? California, that's correct. for California. Um, so with us, we have uh, currently 19 different investment options. We're going to be increasing that in uh, the next couple of weeks here. But usually 529 plans do have an incremental um, a set number of uh, investment options that are allowed by the program manager. With that, sometimes when you invest in uh, retirement accounts, uh, your 401k, uh, specifically in a brokerage account, you will most likely have more options investing in that. So it, it depends on what your priorities are, but again, on what you're specifically saving for too. Okay. All right. So um, I have a couple questions about individuals and misconceptions. Yeah. So let's say I'm a parent, which I am. And in this case, let's say I have real estate and I'm thinking, you know what, I'm going to take a second mortgage on the real estate property that I have, mm -hmm. and I forgo the 529 plan. Is that a good option? It could be an option, it is an option, yep. but what is your thought on that? We, we get asked quite often as far as uh, you know, financial aid information, um, what's the best option for me? Um, essentially, I can't provide any financial aid advice, I'm not a financial aid counselor, mm -hmm. but there are you know, facts, information that you can use. Uh, when you're looking at the FAST application, the expected family contribution, what they're looking at is if you're filing it under the, the student being the, the person attending the university that's living under the parents. This is the FAFSA, right? FAFSA, free FAFSA. application okay. for... So uh, the, the uh, tuition for California. Yes. Right. Okay. When they're applying for, say, in-state college, um, public, private university, they're most likely going to have to fill out that FAFSA application. Whenever you pull money, uh, say, from your, your mortgage, uh, the expected family contribution is going to look at a couple of things. They're going to look at for parental assets, if it's owned by the parents, since you mentioned it, um, say for yourself. Mm. Uh, they're going to look at anything that's non-retirement money, so non-401k, non-IRA money. Uh, so that's going to be banking accounts, checking, uh, savi checking savings accounts, could be your brokerage accounts, could be um, anything else that you have liquid. What they're not going to look at, as I mentioned, is going to be your retirement and your um, equity in your primary residence. So any equity that's uh, in your primary residence, they won't take a look at that. You, you're going to have to kind of weigh the odds. As so far they, as, they, they assume that you're not going to sell your home where you right. actually live in right. to pay for the tuition. Right. Otherwise, you'd be homeless, essentially, or renting or yeah. incurring more expenses that mm -hmm. way. It's, it's, a, it's a way, it's a formula that they've kind of created through the, the federal financial aid application. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but I'm guessing it's, it's around those lines. Okay. Um, so you are able to pull the, the equity off your home. Um, I'm not advising that, but you are able to uh, withdraw money. At, at that point, it seems that you would just have to pay that money back at some point uh, with some interest. So once okay. you withdraw that money, you're going to have to repay that money. Now, that's one option. The other option would be to save money over time. If you have time, if you have the, the ability to save money over time uh, and withdraw that money once your child is of age that needs to go to college, they need to withdraw that money for qualified higher education expenses. That's where the 529 plan would be where you don't have to pay interest on that, you won't have to pay taxes on that money because you've been uh, saving money over time and if hopefully there's going to be some growth in, with that, uh, within that money so you'll be able to withdraw that growth, the, any earnings within that tax-free as long as it's used for qualified higher education expenses. So I've heard that some corporations, companies, entities offer a 529 
tax deferred plan for their employees. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you know? Can you tell us a little bit about yes. that? And how does that compare to the plan that you guys work with? So we have, with ScholarShare, we actually offer the ScholarShare 529 Workplace Savings Program. Uh, it's a program that's administered to employers, to any small to mid-sized, even startups, uh, companies that want to offer this to their employees as an employee benefit. They can do so through direct deposit contributions. So this is a free benefit for those, for those employers. Uh, the State of California ScholarShare Investment Board does not charge them anything, so there's no fees for doing that, for offering it to their employees. And we work with pretty much everybody, as I mentioned, small to mid-sized to even startups as well. Um, that some people ask us, what's the minimum requirement? As long as you have interested employees there, as long as we have somebody that can uh, either in person or host a virtual webinar with them, uh, we'd be happy to go out there and speak to that company, speak to those employees. So it could be one or two employees mm -hmm. and they, if they have somebody assigned to go ahead and host a webinar, you guys would go over there and do We'd be happy to service with yeah. okay. either in person. Uh, we have consultants all throughout California, so not okay. just here in San Diego. I'm the San Diego consultant, but Los Angeles, Orange County, uh, Inland Empire, San Francisco, Bay Area, Oakland, and Sacramento as well. What is the, um, obviously this is something that a lot of parents are interested. Um, how much do they need to actually start an account? So previously, we would always ask for a $25 uh, initial deposit. We've actually, we're making some changes to our website, the ScholarShare 529 website. It's going to be different from uh, different call, 529 college savings programs. But with ours, we're going to decrease that actually to just $1. $1? Uh, we're trying okay. to make it very easy, okay. uh, no barrier to, to entry in this case for the college savings programs. Okay. So even just with $1, um, you can set up automatic contributions that way. Of course, we'd always recommend making automatic contributions, uh, making at least setting that up. So that's kind of like the set it and forget it. You're going to be depositing money into there, similar to like your 401k retirement money, where the money is just going to be deposited into the account. It's going to continue to grow and set up automatic contributions will be uh, one of our, our key uh, recommendations when parents sit down with us and look at a savings uh, starting to save for college for their children. Okay, what is the uh, average ROI that you've seen for the past year and for the past five years? So it's really going to depend on the investment, the risk okay. tolerance. Um, it's going to be whether you're uh, very conservative. So there's different levels. There's different. So uh, there's different uh, different types of portfolios yes. that the parent can actually. Let's say somebody is not really savvy in the stock market or looking at portfolios or mutual funds for that matter, it, and they have no idea what to pick. Yeah. How, how, how do they do that? And how? Is there support to actually manage that from yes. your office? Okay. Yeah, of course, that's, that's where we'd come in. We'd provide them with the information. We're not going to provide direct uh, direct advice or recommendations because we are a direct 529 program. Mm -hmm. uh, there are differences. There are advisors sold 529 plans. We can go through the services of financial advisor, um, and they, they are able to assist you with that. They might be able to provide more complicated uh, kind of financial planning for college savings. Uh, but there's going to be some differences in fees, some differences in uh, recommendations, some differences in account performance. You might have more options with them, whereas in a direct 529 plan, we're going to have a, a, a select menu, per se, of investment portfolio options. Um, as I mentioned, uh, using California Scholarship as an example, again, 19 different investment options uh, where you can invest in either mutual funds, index funds. You can invest in uh, single fund portfolio options, multi-fund portfolio options. You mentioned what if somebody's not very savvy in investing. We offer uh, one that's called an age-based portfolio, where it's very similar to like a target date portfolio for okay. work, where right. it's based on your the date that you plan to retire, whereas in the age-based, it's actually based on the child's age. Um, based on that child's age, we automatically shift the asset allocation for them. So it starts off more aggressive in the earlier years, say zero to four, uh, we call age bands, zero to four age bands, then it becomes, um, it shifts that asset allocation to become more and more conservative as they right. age, okay. uh, with the objective of uh, starting, starting off more aggressive, then progressing through the different age bands to become more conservative just so that they can start making those higher education cost payments once they get to that college age. Okay. Let's say a parent out there never actually invested or opened up an account, savings account, whatever, and now they're thinking about it, but they're in their mind, they're like, oh my God, you know, I missed those first 10 years of my child, mm -hmm. and now the child is 10, 12 years old, yes. and you're thinking, well... Is it too late to open up a 529 yep. account? That's usually, we, we get asked that all, quite often, and it, right. honestly, it's, it's never too late. Um, personally, me seeing it, and just in this community, last time I'm sure you, you've yeah. heard about this before as well, is even $1,000 can make a difference between somebody going to 
uh, going from a community college to, a, uh, say, a community uh, California State University or uh, an in-state university. So even $1,000, even $25 a month can really make a difference. Uh, so you can start saving with a small amount. You can start saving with large amounts in the, these types of programs. It's really going to depend on the, the investor, the saver, as far as what they want to do. But even $25 a month, even uh, $10 a month now uh, would really make a difference and can help pay for tuition, can help pay for books, can help pay for any type of expense that that student may later occur uh, down the road. So it, Thank you. There's a, there's a question. You bring up you know, the, the paying for tuition, paying for books. So it could be literally used for anything school related. Um, there's no exceptions. There are some exceptions. There so, are. What are the exceptions? So it's actually very, it's, it's spelled out directly with the IRS, Section 529 of the IRS tax code. That's where it comes from. So it's, it's, you're able to use it for tuition and fees, room and board, books and equipment, uh, related technology. So equipment's very broad, but uh, essentially the most common equipment, your laptops, your computers, your software, um, you, you're able to use it for college application fees. You're able to use it for internet fees as well. Can you if use it for the SAT, PSAT, which are preparation exams preparation for exams. college entry? Not, not at the moment. No, not, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. So it's a good question, not, not at the moment for that. Okay. Um, there are some extended uses of it now. So within the last couple of years, uh, the most recent one uh, was the SECURE Act. I don't know if you've heard of the SECURE Act that just no, recently I passed. Not, no, uh, So with the SECURE Act uh, that was recently passed in the last two weeks at the very end of 2019, um, it was mostly based on retirement. So um, with, with the SECURE Act, it actually had some changes for 529 plans. Within those changes to 529 plans, uh, the key ones were being the use of funds. So you're able to use it for apprenticeship expenses now. Okay. So expanding on the use of funds. And you're also able to use it for uh, student loan repayments of up to $10,000 per year over the life of that um, 529 plan for that beneficiary. So you're able to use it now for apprenticeships on top of all the, all the other expenses I just mentioned for apprenticeships and student loan repayments. The other key expense that they were that was uh, updated two years ago was used for private K through 12 education. So you're able to use it for any private or religious K through 12 education for up to $10,000 per year for tuition as well. So there's, there's a question that I've heard quite often from parents and I want you to either confirm or debunk the myth. So let's say a parent has two children mm -hmm. or parents have two children in their household and or more and they're not sure if the young child when they're or of age to go to a university or to pursue higher education, mm -hmm. decide not to go. Mm -hmm. They're not going to a higher education and they open up a 529 plan. Yep. Now they have, and they have an account or two accounts, 529 mm -hmm. for each child, yeah. because that's the way you should do it, right? For right. individual child, you should open up a 529 yes. for that individual. Okay. Yes. So let's say you have two or three children. Now you have two or three 529 plans and you have X amount of saved up money, capital in those accounts. Well, the parents, what are they going to do with that money? They cannot withdraw it. They can't touch it. So it's not a savings account. And I think this is a reality where a lot of parents are stopping short of opening a 529 because of that uncertainty the fear of losing the money it's, it's, exactly it's, it's, uh, it's a big fear and we hear it all the time you right. know what's going to happen to my money am i going to lose my money um, and the answer is you're not going to lose your money there the money's still going to be there um, say if for some reason their, their children decide not to go to college they create another facebook app or they become a billionaire overnight um, at that point, they don't need to go to college, right? Yeah, I mean, so, hopefully they do. <laughs> exactly. Yes, of that's course. Every yeah. that's <laughs> the next my, Facebook developer. My right. dream for my daughter, yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but um, at that point, if you're stuck with an account, you have three options. So say if you have money left over in the account, um, as I mentioned, it's, it is after-tax money that's deposited into okay. the 529 plans. Okay. So whatever, the first option would be if you have multiple children, since you provided that scenario where there's two accounts, then you can always transfer one account over to the other beneficiary. So you essentially roll it over to the other beneficiary. It's not considered a rollover because okay. it's within the same program, but okay. it's considered a transfer between your beneficiaries. Oh, okay. So you're able to transfer the account from one beneficiary over to the other. Okay. And um, that's assuming one of the beneficiaries decides to go to correct. higher education. Okay. Correct. Say, say if one of them decides um, in this scenario there's two beneficiaries, one of them is not going to college, the other will be using the funds. So you transfer the, the money over to the other beneficiary. 
and ex essentially closing that account off for the one that's not going off to college. Okay. That's one option. There's no penalties. There's no tax uh, consequences for doing that. Uh, the second option would be, if, say, if it's the younger child in the scenario, the second beneficiary, the first one went off to college, the second one, the younger one, is not going off to college, then you have an option of uh, keeping in the account what's called a legacy account. So these accounts are for looking really further down the road where you're going to have some grandchildren. Okay. These are for individuals that are not going to So you can keep it for a long yes. period of time? for a very okay. long period of time. There's so no age limits, oh, no there's time no limits. age limits. Okay. Yep. All right. There's no necessarily maturity end of account thing no. type of thing. No. Okay. So they can grow in, uh, in perpetuity in, the, in that sense where the, the earnings, the growth of the account will continue to grow. Um, and then at, later on down the road, if there's a grandchild um, in there, you can transfer that account to that future grandchild. And that account, uh, again, there will be no tax consequences or penalties for transferring that money over to that beneficiary. And in the meantime, it still accrues the interest yes. rate. Yes. Okay. It still All continues right. to grow uh, with the market if it's invested or depending on if you're saving it, depending on how you're, you're saving it. Okay. The third option there would be, uh, say if none of those are, are an option for you, you need the money for some emergency or you just need to withdraw the money from the account, then you can always withdraw that money. Um, as I mentioned before, since it's post-tax, after-tax contributions, the money that you've deposited, you're able to withdraw tax-free. Okay. You'd only pay taxes, which So is, my contributions, I can withdraw, no penalties whatsoever. No penalties. But the interest growth mm -hmm. would get taxed. Correct. Okay. So you're looking right. at federal and state income taxes, as well as a federal penalty and a state penalty here in the state of California. Depending on where you're watching this from, um, it may be different. So here in California, um, it's a... You're looking at federal penalty will be about 10%, state penalty will be about 2.5%, uh, and then based on your tax bracket, your federal and state income taxes as well. So let's say I have children and they decide not to go to school, or a person has children, they decide not to go to school. I hope my children go to school. <laughs> um, but uh, let's say that person thinks, oh, well, now I have this money and I'm going to get taxed if I pull it off. What if I wait until I retire to change my tax bracket? Mm -hmm. Will I get taxed differently on the money or does it matter? I, I wouldn't be able to tell you that. I'm not okay. a, a tax uh, okay. advisor. The, oh, yeah. Um, okay. Just I can't the provide question. any tax advice, but okay. um, that'd be a great question for a tax advisor that okay. maybe maybe better suited to answer that for them. Right. It, I'm, just, yeah. I'm just saying because when you're still working, earning income, and you withdraw money from a 401k, they look at your tax bracket at that yes. period of time. But if you wait to retire and you have a fixed income at that point and yep. your tax bracket changes, then you get taxed on that new tax bracket. Yes. So that's, I'm just assuming that might be the same similar scenario Possibly. situation. Yes. Okay, great. How did you get involved in in the 529 or the financial advisor. I mean, you could you could be a banker, you could be doing so many other things, working yeah. for a, a bigger industry type of job. Yeah, I actually used to work for a bank, uh, used to work at uh, one of the large banks here, and used to work in the um, in premier banking, private banking for a bank. Um, doing that for about four or five years, um, I was contacted by this company, was told about the great opportunity to work for, just specifically a 529 plans, helping people save money for future contributions. And I kind of looked at it as this is something back then, this is close to four years ago, was not very known. Uh, we knew about it in you know, the financial advising side of it, but it wasn't something that was very common, uh, still not very common now, I think only one out of four people have a, a 529 plan today. Right. But back then it was even worse. So I saw this as something that can be continue to grow in the future. There's probably going to be more opportunities here in the future. And the reason that it's not very well known is because there's a lot of misconceptions, yes. a lot of word of mouth myths. And, you know, we are in an age of technology and information. But even in this region, particularly in the Latino community, and this yes. is what we're focusing on, um, there is a lot of unknowns and a lot of myths and we still prefer to keep our cash closed yes. to so that we can withdraw it or move it or do whatever we want yes so would you suggest that the latino community actually open up a 529 mm -hmm. do you have a 529 I personally do. okay all right, did you open it before you started working at the 529? Okay. Yes, yeah, so I was actually looking at it. Uh, it's, very, it's a great question. I was actually looking at a 529 plan uh, before I actually came on board at TIA. When my daughter was born four years ago, it was actually at the same time, 
Um, that's when I was looking at the California 529 plan, comparing it to different 529 plans. Um, at the same moment, I got hired on with California, decided, hey, you know what, what's the best way to know about a product, know about something, then to actually open an account and do it for yourself. So at that moment, because my daughter, I, I transitioned over to TIA. Uh, my daughter was born at the very exact same time. I established an account for my daughter, have it with the uh, scholarship 529. But um, I do, it's, to me, I'd recommend it for anybody that's looking to save money for future college expenses. If you know that this money is going to be um, earmarked specifically for higher education expenses, then that's going to be, this would most likely be the best product for you as far as savings. If you know that this might, money might be used for something else, you might want to look at different options for you. Okay. But as far as looking at something that's going to be earmarked, you know that this is specifically for higher education expenses for yourself, for your children, for a loved one, or somebody that you're designating this money for, a 529 plan would probably be the best option. So you mentioned for yourself, meaning the parents. Yes. So I'm assuming with that, that if for some reason you become an employed hope it doesn't happen but let's say you become unemployed and you have a 529 for your children can you roll that over transfer it over to yourself yes because you're pursuing a different additional education career path and whatnot you go back in and you seek out a technical school and get some additional classes can can you actually do that yes exactly we, we oh, see it quite often okay. where uh, parents will use the money before especially if you have young children and you've created quite amount of money in there I'm not recommending this, but we've seen well, parents course, yeah, that uh, have transferred the, the balances over to themselves, used it for their higher education, later on down the road, went back and deposited money back into the, their children's account, transferred the account back over to the child. So it's kind of a win-win situation in that sense where they had money saved, they needed money for their own education, right. they transferred that money over to themselves. Later on, when they were done with the account, they paid off their education, then they transferred it back to the child and hopefully they're going to be in the same position, or if not better. Is there a fee to transfer over from one individual to another? No. No, no. there is no fee. No tax so consequences. No, no tax, fees. no fees, no. no transactional fees to transfer name. Correct. The, the only requisite with that is that it has to be, you can only transfer once per year. It has to go from one uh, direct relative to another. So it has to be a direct relative of that first beneficiary. Okay. So let's say the one of the child, one of the children actually got quite a few scholarships mm -hmm. because they're awesome yeah. and they're bright and they're a superstar, right? Yes. And they hustled and they filled out as many applications for scholarships yes. that they could. What happens with the financial situation? Does the financial office actually look and consider that scholarship money and also look at their 529 and negates them obtaining additional financial aid? So I, I can only speak on the 529 fund okay. side of it. I'm sure merit-based uh, scholarships will most likely not be viewed when okay. considering financial, uh, okay. when considering the expected family contribution, when ex uh, looking at FAFSA, federal financial aid. Um, they, they most likely will not look at merit-based scholarships. They might look at needs-based scholarships, but again, I'm not a financial aid counselor. I'm not able to provide financial aid advice. When they're looking at something I do know is when they're looking at 529 plans specifically for any type of qualified tuition program, uh, that's only if it's owned by the parent, it's only going to count up to 5.6% of that account balance. 5.6%. So okay. Say if there's $10,000 in that account, they're only going to count $560 up to the most. Some, some universities may count it differently. Uh, we're all qualified higher education institutions will uh, offer federal financial aid. Some will also offer what's called a CSS profile, and that's for private universities. They might count it a little bit differently when looking at needs-based financial aid, but for specifically FAFSA purposes, when looking at the expected family contribution, uh, when they're looking at these types of programs, any type of parental assets, uh, they're going to look at whether that's money in your checking account, money in your savings account, they're going to count the balance up to 5.6% uh, of that balance. And that's going to be part of what you're expected to pay as a parent towards that, that university uh, on there. So okay. the other uh, important thing to mention there is that when it's not owned by the parent, say if it's owned by a grandparent or a non-parent owned account, it's considered a little bit different. So it, it's considered where they're, they're withdrawing the money, they're giving it to the, the uh, student or the beneficiary so in this it's case. It's a monetary gift. It's, give, it's uh, considered a uh, earned income when considering it for the federal financial aid. Oh. So that could potentially reduce aid by up to 50%, depending on who owns the accounts can be very crucial um, as far as who owns the account for uh, federal financial aid purposes. And again, there's different um, 
ways of looking at this, depending if that individual needs federal financial aid, if they're looking for needs-based aid. Uh, That's a very interesting point. And yep. you just got me thinking about, okay, if somebody else opens up a 529 for a child, mm -hmm. like a grandparent in this case, yeah. and the grandparent says, you know, I don't, I don't want this to be considered as income. Mm -hmm. how, how, can you, how can you avoid that? Uh, you know, that's a tax, a tax advisor. Okay. You know, that, that, so, so that's a tax, the yeah. CPA, yeah, CPA type, gift type of estate, conversation. Gift okay. and estate planner, financial mm -hmm. aid planner right there. How far do yeah. they, does the uh, investigation or the record keeping, yeah. do they go back and look so, at who owns that account? So it's because actually, they uh, could transfer the account to the parents. Yes. Uh, okay. So FASA will look at two years prior income. Okay. So when you fill out the, the FASA application, they're looking at two years prior income. They're not looking at this year's income, uh, say for last year, 2019 when they had to uh, fill out their FAST application in the fall for 2019. So they don't go back all the way to the origination of the account if no. it was opened up 10 years ago. I, as a grandparent, opened it up and then gave it to you, mm -hmm. Lugo, and said, hey, you know, Julio, here's the, here's the account, put it in your name for your child. Right. And then, then 20 years down the line, your child goes to school. Mm -hmm. The financial aid office is not going to go back 20 years. Yeah, mo most okay. likely not. Okay. Uh, what they are going to look at is uh, income, both income for the student, income for the parents. They're going to look at assets. So if, say if that um, student, that beneficiary, uses the money from the 529 plan their freshman year of um, college, they're most likely going to have to report that by their junior year um, on the FAST application mm -hmm. as income that they received. Uh, some grandparents have used a strategy where they'll withdraw the money for junior, senior year of college, third and fourth year, okay. um, assuming that they don't attend uh, another semester of college right after that fourth year of college. Okay. So they've used that money and something that students would not have to report on the FAST application. Okay. But again, it's not something that we would recommend. It's not something So we this advise. is when they're junior or sophomore in high school or college? Co co you yeah. did mention college. Junior okay. or a senior. Okay. Uh, why, why would they do that? They, as long as they don't attend another semester right after that year, mm -hmm. um, it's money that they would not have to report on the, the oh, FAST application. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. So we've been talking about the 529 for the scholarship in California. Mm -hmm. Being said California, what if the child decides to go to a school out of state? Yeah. Can they use the 529 that they open or that they have in California for an out of state? They can. So okay. it's open to any uh, state, whether you open that in California, as long as it's a college savings plan, okay. then you're able to use that money um, anywhere throughout the nation and even some schools abroad. So you're not limited to staying within the California State School District um, as far as universities or UC system. You're able to use that money anywhere that uh, they're qualified higher education institutions. That, that's a great question because it also includes two-year community college, includes uh, four-year public or private universities, uh, includes uh, master degree programs, doctor degree programs, includes trade schools, technical schools, or vocational schools, as well as uh, apprenticeships as well. Okay, so let's say they decide to go international. You mentioned they have to look at the specific school. So they actually have to ask, hey, can I use my 529 plan for this? Yes, they, okay. there's a list. Um, you can look at FASA.org as far as accredited universities or uh, higher education institutions. And that'll tell you which institutions are accredited here in the United States as well as which institutions are accredited abroad as well. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for all that explanation. And I have a couple more questions. Um, how and what has been the most rewarding part of working with the financial planning system and providing 529 information to the community? I think it's, it's this, doing community outreach to our Latino community. Uh, uh, through TIA, we, we have a program where I've helped spearhead on the Latino initiative, where okay. we're trying to do more outreach to our Latino uh, community, Spanish-speaking community, and it, it's been really tough to kind of, as you mentioned, you know, what is the 529 plan? There's so many misknowns. So I think this part, being able to specifically in my hometown, my hometown here in Chula Vista, uh, where you can pass along this information to people that have never heard about 529 plans right. in the past. Yeah. Uh, th there's no education about saving for college. Um, there's no real planning for saving for college. It's just, you know, I hope my son goes to college. You know, I'm, I'm going to have him go through high school. He gets his high school diploma, and then it's on him uh, or her to go to college at that point. And college has been increasing as far as cost, the cost goes, of tuition yes. and books and uh, room and board if they're going yes. to live on there. So it's, it's going to be really hard for a lot of individuals to actually attend yeah. college. Um, have you seen in your experience an increase of individuals attending college using the 529 plan? 
we, so each year we have increased both the assets that we manage, assets under management, as well as account, uh, account ownership and account new accounts. So year after year, not just in the scholarship program, but we also have um, great reports that come out from savingforcollege.com, from college planning networks that will provide the information as far as how much the industry has grown within the last year. And then they'll look at a five-year look back and then, of course, more data and graphical information. Um, so it, it has grown year after year, okay. and it's expected to continue to grow year after year for, for the next couple of years as well. Okay. Yeah. What is the biggest obstacle or the biggest problem that you've encountered and that you've helped solve so far? Help solve is it's been, it's been kind of tricky to say help solve because you do so much work that, you, you know, it's not tangible work like this where I'm not able to, I'm talking to, to somebody, but I'm not able to see if they actually right. take this information and do something with it. Exactly. So it's, right. it's kind of hard to say that the tangible part of it where, you know, what have I directly affected or what, what has my work directly uh, resulted in. But I think this outreach has been very important, specifically to our Latino community, okay. where we want to be able to provide you with the, the information, the education. A lot of the pushback that we get, as you mentioned, what's been a pushback is, well, where are you located? Are you a bank? Where can I go and walk into and, and do this uh, with you? Right. Where we do have offices here in San Diego and a lot of offices throughout the state, but mostly everything is done online. And yeah, when phone. it comes to money, and like I mentioned, the Latino community, it, we're very skittish yes. because we're like, you know what, it, it sounds a little skittish yeah. putting money on an online, on, on into a, an account that is online. Yeah. And you have to build trust. Yes. So you have to yes. see the person yes. that you're actually handing the money to. Yes. So if I don't see you, yeah. it's kind of that nebulous shadow smoke behind the mirror. Yep. And you're going to be more reluctant to actually open an account. Exactly. Versus me now meeting Julio Cesar who's telling me this is a good thing to do. This is going to be the, the rewards if you actually do it. This is how you can do it. If I have any questions. I can reach out to you. Yes. Be more personable. Be more in contact. Yes. I'm more willing to say, okay, I'm going to open up an account. Yeah. Right? Is that what you've seen? Exactly. That's okay. uh, been one of our biggest obstacles, one of our biggest hurdles um, as far as specifically with our Latino market, our, our Latino community, our Spanish-speaking community that we really want to be able to provide this information to outreach. Um, it's, you know, where are you located? Where can I go in and, and sit down with you? And we have those meetings. We have the ability to go and sit down with them. But if we don't have one close to our Latino community, it gets harder and harder for us to actually have those meetings with them. So, Are you actually thinking about opening an office down in the South Bay area? I, I'm located all of San Diego, so it'd be hard to so get another person. So you're mobile? Person. I'm mobile. You're yeah, mobile. So I'm, I'm okay. willing to meet an, anybody anywhere. So, Okay. All right. Is, um, so I have a couple more questions. And this one is for more of a personal level. Uh, mm -hmm. do you, if you could have any superpower, mm -hmm. what would it be? It's a great question. Um, and why? Yeah, no, 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 right. <laughs> uh, I, as far as superpowers, I think the ability to fly anywhere that you want to go. Okay. Uh, because you need to be mobile. You need to be mobile, right? right? Yeah, exactly. I, I fly from time to time just to either pers uh, internal meetings or client meetings. And you have to do a lot of waiting at the airport. You have to rely on other people to kind of do their job and make sure that you, they, get the, you, they get you there safely. Whereas if we had the ability to fly ourselves, go places, uh, specifically with, with traffic. Here in San Diego, traffic's been really bad. Recently. It's starting to get worse <laughs> year after year. Yeah. When right. you travel to LA, it gets even worse. When you yes, travel to exactly. Orange County. so Yeah, the, I mean, going up, once you go above Camp Pendleton, it's yeah. just, you know, it just gets horrendous, but that's another yeah. story. That's another topic. Exactly. Being um, able to fly with my briefcase and just, you right. know, take everything, my laptop, right. get there in like two or three minutes, uh, right. just driving here because the traffic took me a while. So, right. Yeah. Where, were you coming from? I was just coming from my house. That's about 10 minutes away, but traffic okay. on the way over here. Okay. If I would have been able to fly, I would have gotten here in like three or four minutes. Okay. There you go. <laughs> and there's a lot of construction going on too yeah. in several places. So I understand. Yes. Yeah. Um, what would you say the definition of success for Julio Cesar Lugo is at question. this moment? Um, I think that I would say it's, it's being able to do what I love, uh, being able to stay focused, stay motivated, and doing it in a community where I love, uh, being with the, uh, the people that I love. So I grew up in Chula Vista. I do a lot of events throughout San Diego, but it's, it's, it hasn't been as many in my hometown of Chula Vista. So being able to do this and have a broader outreach with, say, with your YouTube channel, with your right. success, yeah. Lazaro, uh, being able to provide outreach to, you know, hopefully thousands and thousands of viewers, 
um, this is something that I, I find successful. So I, I want to be able to do this on a larger scale like you, uh, you. something that we can uh, provide outreach, not just individually one-on-one, one one, but ho hopefully to a larger uh, margin to more of a larger community and provide this specifically more to our Latino community where I work with everybody, but where we feel that our efforts need to be uh, and focused on is on our Latino Spanish speaking community. So right. provide this information. And you are bilingual, correct? I am bilingual, yes. Él habla español, así es que si tienen preguntas, pueden comunicarse con él en español sin ningún problema. Sí. So, about how can they contact you? It, yeah. Number, phone number, email, yes. uh, Facebook account, LinkedIn yes. account. So uh, can you give us the you, information? You can contact me. Uh, my telephone number directly. It's 858-888-4016. Eh, teléfonos área 858-888-4016. Email address, you can contact me. It's Julio, uh, J-U-L-I-O, Cesar, C-E-S-A-R, dot Lugo, L-U-G-O, at... TIAA.org, TIA.org. Uh, you can find that by electronic mail. I'm on LinkedIn if you guys want to add me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, those would be the primary ways to contact me. Either call me, send me an email, uh, message me on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to work with uh, anybody that has any questions, specifically about 529 plans. Um, yeah, reach me through there. Yeah, so one last question. Yes. If you, if you could jump into a time machine mm -hmm. and you could go back, Yes. And you could meet little Julio Cesar yes. at 10 years <laughs> old. Yes. What would you share with him? Like three pieces of advice or something that you would want to share with him that you've learned over the years? Yeah, I think the importance, first of all, would be the, the importance of knowing, uh, learning, the importance of knowledge, uh, valuing that since I was very little. Um, I, I still love to learn, I still love to read, I still love to learn new things, but um, installing that myself, that actually didn't come until later on, until after high school. The, the wanting, the, the yearning for actually learning, uh, listening to podcasts, reading books, listening to audiobooks, that didn't come to me later on in life until after high school. So if I can install that in myself at a very early age, I would instill that as a principle to me uh, at a very early age. The second piece would be to um, look at other fields that may have been unlooked back then, like the STEM fields, the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, um, applying more of my skill set to some of those. Um, it's a huge field. It's going to continue to be a huge field, and it's something that I want my daughter to be looking at, and it's something that I'm going to have my daughter look into as well. Right. Um, so the second thing would be looking at more STEM type of programs. The third field would be, the third um, lesson I would say is um, starting my own business, um, looking at uh, ways for me to create a business at a, a younger age, whether that's going to be my primary focus or a secondary focus, um, always looking at different uh, avenues of making income. So that'd be uh, my third advice, piece of advice for myself. All right. Well, thank you so much, Julio. Thank you, thank you for being here with Success Innovation. Yes. Really appreciate it. And now we're going to put the uh, information, telephone number, email, LinkedIn account in the description of the video. And I want to say thank you to the viewers, to the listeners of Success Innovation. This has been a wonderful experience for me to talk to Julio Cesar, who is a Chula Vista native and is willing to share and express some information about the 529 financial advice for college. And this is a podcast of pursuing higher education and finding technology and finding innovation within yourself to be successful. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching another wonderful episode of Success Innovation. If you're watching this video, you can get Julio Cesar's telephone or email by taking it down from his business card. Otherwise, you can look at it at the description notes. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Have a wonderful day.